أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يبركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا والطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العصر والزمان خليفة الرحمن إمام الإنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالحدى والدين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله على محمد وعلى محمد We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the continued blessings of the month of Ramadan Last night as a introduction to the month we talked very briefly about a few reminders of the glory of this month how to approach this month and what to expect from this month. And as I promised to you last night, I will um, introduce my topic uh, tonight. I am with you for the next two weeks, inshallah. And <clears throat> one of uh, the most difficult things as a speaker to do uh, is to come up with a topic that's relevant. And uh, a topic that's, uh, that, that's applicable and one that applies to not only the youth but also to families and elders alike. And while there is an ocean of topics out there to talk about, what I usually use as my tool to kind of prep, especially when you have such a long stretch of two weeks with one community, you can really exhaust one topic to its fullest across two weeks, is I look at the various questions that come my way or various issues that come my way, and I kind of do, I look for a common theme um, <clears throat> where things are kind of moving towards. And based on that, uh, I come up with a topic. Now, this past, I would say, six months to ten months, even a year maybe, the level of questioning, the amount of questioning, and the topics of those questions, for me, sometimes were concerning. And let me also make this point in the beginning as well, and all of you know me very well. Uh, I am a huge advocate of questions. I welcome them, I mean, forget me, the deen is an advocate of questions. Islam is a, a, a religion that welcomes the skeptic and asks you to doubt and asks you to ask questions. However, it also says for you to do um, your level best to respect that doubt and to give that skepticism its due respect. Meaning what? If you have a, a question and you have a doubt, go to the proper channels to erase that doubt. The problem sometimes is that our youth today are um, skeptical about a lot of things in the deen, and they should be, and that's beautiful about them, but they don't go sometimes to the various proper channels to erase that skepticism. And so it's a very fine line between doubt and kufr, that something you doubt eventually becomes something that you don't believe in anymore, if that doubt is left to fester inside of you. What's happening now and I'll get to my topic soon, inshallah. But what's happening now is there are questions about our aqidah. And the questions used to come from outside our circles. Now they're coming from very deep within our circles. And when I say our aqidah, I mean the Islamic ideology. I'll explain the verse that I read for you in the khutbah. It's a very famous verse that talks about why Allah sent the Holy Prophet. But before that, I want to make sure that all of us understand something very clearly. You know, when I was being raised in Toronto, there were certain things that were told to me inside of my home that were just a given, that I wouldn't question them. 
And maybe that was a, a different era of ignorance, a different era of kind of you know, simplicity back then. There really wasn't scholars back then that could speak my language that I could even debate on. But back then, you know, there were simpler times. I'm talking about the 80s and 90s. Um, now I find that with information, where there should be an increase in knowledge, there's now an increase in skepticism. It's too much out there. And it's too readily available for everyone to, to benefit from or to not to benefit from. And so the point that I want to come across and my topic for this two weeks, we'll call it the privilege of faith. That will be my lecture series. The privilege of faith. And I'll explain what I mean by that. I'll give you a, a couple examples of the questions that come to me now from Shia youth. For example, the question is, um, you know, why can't the maraje change the fatwas for us to be able to do sujood on carpet so that we don't upset another group of Muslims? Um, why do we have to include Ali and Waliullah in the adhan when we know there's one person in that, in that mahfil or gathering that may not accept Imam Ali as the wali of Allah? Why do we have to always combine prayers? Why can't we separate them like the Sunni brothers do? And all of this is <clears throat> not a question for them to understand why it's done. It's a question for us to appease another group of people outside of us. And the way the question is being presented, and I ask my parents in the audience who have young kids, uh, teenage children, even my youth in the audience themselves, to please listen very carefully. My initial lecture is extremely important to set the base. I don't want confusion moving forward. You can come and find me afterwards, please. The questions being asked, not all of them, some of them are not being asked to, 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 to learn. They're being asked to, uh, almost as if there is an acceptance that the Shia ideology is the minority and thus they are the wrong ideology. And so the Shia ideology should do its level best to kind of merge with the mainstream. And so anything that we do as Shias that set us apart, we should remove that from our ideology. And do our level best to not be this, this outsider rebel group that, that, that's been referred to sometimes that just wants to make things different and difficult for everybody else. It'd be a lot easier if we could just kind of take these few things out of our fiqh and out, out of our aqidah. It, you know, it would really make for a harmonizing of the deen. That to me is a, is a big concern for me. Because number one is that the individual, and not just one, several individuals who are Shia in their faith are asking these questions. The concern there is not so much about the fact that the deen looks better. The concern there is that the Shia faith was wrong from day number one. And the word is compromise. And the word is to bend and apologize. And almost as if to say, look, whatever happened in the past, you know, Saqifa was not accepted, Ghadir was shoved down our throat, Imam Hussein is constantly remembered, all these things are there, but now things are different. Now we have the control to be able to kind of, you know, camouflage into the deen. And they've reduced the deen into a, a, a play on numbers, which means what majority must be right and minority must be wrong. And it comes from a might is right phenomenon that's happening right now all over the world, right? That the might can do whatever they want, but because the might is right, we turn a blind eye, right? So Saudi can kill 37 people without any sort of reason, and the world turns a blind eye. <clears throat> One person is killed wrong, let's say, in another part of the world, and there's uproar. There's filters and hashtags and God knows what else, right? So that's where it comes from. The might is right phenomenon trickles down into our deen, where now they're the might and they're right, so we must now, as he said, compromise. Now that has an immense impact on your deen. You start to chip away at the base of yaqeen and start to question everything. Why can't we open our fast a little bit earlier? So one big dasakhan of us and every other Muslim out there. What a beautiful message. Why do we have to be 50 minutes after they open their fast? There are so many questions. And when you give them the logical answers, they don't accept because they're not looking for logical answers. They're looking because we're not the proper group of, that, that should represent Islam. And that's the problem. And that's really what I want to understand and get across to myself and all of you the, the, these next two weeks. It is a privilege that we've been raised as Shia Muslims. 
The word is privilege. And I'll use that word a thousand times. The verse that I read for you does not refer to adiyan. It refers to deen. Deen is singular in, in, in the Arabic language. The one who sent his prophet with guidance. And the righteous deen. And the right deen. Why did he do that? Now, follow me very carefully. The word zahur in our understanding, and we, you know, we equate that to our 12th Imam all the time. These are words that we use very, very randomly. Zahur does not mean, like someone, like, like a layman like me, sometimes believes that the word zahur means you know, the revealing of somebody, correct? We sometimes take the Urdu meaning that you know, something that was not zahir becomes zahir. And so we, we wait for the imam to come almost, and maybe I'm wrong, but almost as if you know, a curtain will, will, will part and out walk, will walk the imam and say, I'm, I'm here. And that's the zuhur of the imam. So we're waiting for that revelation or the revealing of the imam to come and we, we, we lower it to a physical act, to a revealing of it. He's gonna become zahir. But we don't understand the Quranic use of the word zuhur. And let's understand the Quranic use of the word zuhur and build our base on this. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now there are things I'll talk about these next two weeks that are very sensitive. And you know, before I get to the topic on, on, on zuhur and the Quran, let me also make this point very clear to all of you. This is not a discussion that goes against the basis of unity. Unity, ittihad, that our marajir are constantly talking about and that we should absolutely uphold, it does not mean that we need to sacrifice our ideology. It does not mean that you remove things from history. It doesn't mean that you rewrite history or rip pages out of history. History is there, it will always be there. It does not mean that you remove Ali and Walila from the Adhan or that you stop doing sujood on Khaki Shifa. That's not what ittihad is. Ittihad is not a compromising or an apologizing of your, of your ideology, nor is it the accepting of wrong ideology. That's not what ittihad is. It's not like all of a sudden now, because I'm in this mosque, I can pray on carpet and pray with my arms folded. You can't. It's not like all of a sudden now, tomorrow, at, you, you can walk in a masjid and, 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 and say, Ameen, instead of Ilahi Ameen. You can't. That's not what the maraji are talking about. The maraji, when they talk about ittihad, they talk about taking the discussion to a kulli level and not be stuck on juziyat of the deen. That why are their arms folded this way and that way, why are our, our, our arms open, right? The miraja are saying focus on those things that are kulli by nature, the rooftop view, and go from there. That's what ittihad is, to focus on those things that are kulli, not juzi, because the enemy wants you to consume yourself with these small little details, size of beards, and how high someone's pants are, and how, you know, and, and their names, and their salat, and what time is their iftar, and what time is out, and those are juziyat, meanwhile the enemy is destroying us, bit by bit. Ittihad is, look, forget the juziyat, focus on the kul, and just enough for you to focus on the enemy. It does not mean, like I said, for us to not have ayam fatimiyah and not commemorate the shahadat of, of our mother. It doesn't mean that we can't go out and have jalousas on the streets of our cities, right? So this discussion I'll have in the next two weeks is not against ittihad of the Muslimin. It is strengthening our own backyard so we have the strength to unite with others. Does that make sense to all of you? If we're, we're, we're weak in our own backyard and we attempt to bring others in, we can't be able to hold that weight. Right? We need to really strengthen our aqidah and the Shia aqidah specifically. And when I say Shia, I'm going to use Shia and Islam interchangeably. Because again, the verse says, يُظْهِرُ And if all of you have seen the English translation, it does not say that the, the, you know, Allah has sent the Prophet so he can un unveil the deen. No. The verse says, so he, so he could, or, or, or that deen could, prevail over all other deens. Prevail is the word used to describe zuhur of that deen. So now if we apply that to, the, to, 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 to Imam Zamana, it's not going to be a, you know, a parting of a curtain and out walks the imam. When the imam, when we talk about waiting for the zuhur of the imam, we talk about the idea that the imam's ideology will prevail over every other ideology. That's the essence of the zuhur of imam. So now when we are waiting for the zuhur of the imam, we're waiting for the ultimate victory of, the Islam, of Islam. 
the ultimate prevailing of the deen. Okay? Let's be careful how we use these words and let's understand them properly. Okay? So this idea of us prevailing over everything else has to first come from within, within us. Before the imam comes and begins his prevailing over other ideologies, that ideology of the imam has to first prevail inside of us. And that's where it doesn't happen. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <clears throat> so yes, there are discussions now that we have to have to make sure that things that are every day for our parents in that generation are not every day for our children. Because what this era requires is a high level of certainty. And I will tonight present to you this chain, and I'll break out that chain for the next few lectures. The chain of this deen, and anywhere you've seen the deen in, 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 in the Quran, it refers to one singular deen. There are not more than one Islam out there. Islam has always been one, it always will be one, it's one today, it'll be one tomorrow. There aren't a thousand Islams out there. There's one Islam out there, right? It's al-yawm akmata lakum deenakum. It's one deen. It's just a matter of figuring out what that path of that deen is. And that path of deen has to travel through the Holy Prophet. Allah says, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fatabi'uni yuhbibkum Allah. If they claim to love me, if they say they love me, Follow you, Holy Prophet. Everything you do, you follow the Holy Prophet. When you follow the Holy Prophet, yuhbibkum Allah. You become the mahbub of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you follow the Holy Prophet, unconditionally and absolute following of the Holy Prophet. Not this idea that I'll take this, I'll go to Badr, I'll go to Ahad, I won't go to Khaybar, I'll avoid Khandak, and I won't accept Ghadir. That's not total submission of the Holy Prophet. It's just like those individuals who accepted Nabi Isa as the Prophet of Allah and stopped there and rejected the Holy Prophet of Allah. That's a problem in terms of our faith. That's not complete faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They'll be questioned. And so we're going to have a talk about levels of submission when it comes to Islam. There are levels within levels. There are those that accept Ghadir but stop at the third Imam. There are those that accept the third Imam but stop at the sixth. There are those right now who accept Imam Zamana to be somewhere in Yemen or in some green island. That's also levels of submission. But the idea is that the deen has traveled through one path from the time of Jibreel's revelation to the Holy Prophet to today. It's gone through one path. Anything else that is off that path is distortion of Islam. It's not the deen of haq The deen of haq has gone through the wahi of Jibreel, to the Holy Prophet, through Ghadir, through Karbala, through Imam Zaman al-Zuhur. That's deen haq From you and what you believe in, to the Maraji, to the Imam, to Ghadir, to Wahi, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This, this continuous chain of hidayat from your zat, your individual essence, to the Wahi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deen haq Nothing else. Anything else that triggers or goes off the path from there is a distortion of the deen. It's not deen i haq You can call it whatever you want. You can't call it Islam. Islam has always been one. And that's why we always believe it. it's not about numbers. And let's not get stuck on the idea of numbers. Up and down the history of Islam, up and down the history of the Imams, it's always been a select few that has hold, held the building of Islam firm and uproot. Whether it was the idea that only a handful of individuals accepted the call of Rasulullah, the first war between the, the Kuffar and the Muslimin, where what, one third of the enemy size in Badr were the Muslims? You talk about Jungis Sifin, for example, Mawla Ali had 40,000 troops, Mawi had 100,000 troops, all these things. You talk about the Quran talking about 20 of you. 20 of you sincere ones are 200 of them. It's not about numbers. The Quran refers to Nabi Ibrahim as an ummah, as a nation. He's one farad, he's one individual in number. But what he believes in, his certainty, his mission, equals the fact that he has now become a nation. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <clears throat> the privilege of faith. We have to learn to accept this privilege. If we belong inside of a house where our mothers and our fathers have taught us the importance of ghadir, where we decorate our halls and we wear the best of clothes and we don't miss that program for one second, even though it's entirely in a different language. 
or the idea that every single eve of the first of Muharram, the entire mahal and environment inside the house changes. Things are no longer there. The TV is not opening, for example. You're not wearing this. You're not going here. It's Muharram, this and that. All of these things. We talk about the fact that every Panda Shaban, every 50 Shaban, we talk about the intivad of Imam and Zamana. All these things we should take as a privilege given to us. And that is what deen e haq is. And that's why if you look at the targets of today, the targets of today from Saudi to everybody else has always been on this deen e haq. Anybody else who is outside this deen e haq is not a target for them. Those who are on that deen e haq path, whether in Yemen or Bahrain or Syria or Iraq or Palestine or Kuwait or Nigeria or wherever you want to talk about, are those individuals with a big target on their chest from imperialism of today. That's a sure sign that they're on a path that's different from everybody else. And that path is a, uh, it is a path that is a, uh, a blockage for those who wish to establish their own government today. And that's the path of Dine Haq. It could be a handful, it doesn't matter. Let's not get stuck in might is right numbers. Okay, that's not how the Deen works. That's why you look at the, the, the War of Badr, a prime example of the War of Badr. Allah says, look, you are individuals who hold on to your faith, hold on to your certainty. The enemy could be three times your size, I'll grant you victory. No problem, I'll grant you victory, but hold on to your faith. So we're talking about the idea of the privilege of faith. And that aqidah begins at home, as I say, often. Meaning that you have to constantly tell your children that you are a Shia, you believe in this, this is why you believe in this, and you should be very lucky that you believe in this. And thank your mother who raised you from day number one, who Imam Ali was, and who Imam Hussein was, and blah, blah, blah. All these things are there. We have to understand what deen haq is. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So anything beyond this path is not deen e haq Now, does that mean that we don't work with them? No, of course we work with them. But I'm talking about your individual sense of aqidah inside of you. Okay? We don't believe in religious pluralism, correct? All of you know that. We don't believe that, you know, whether or not you believe in Allah or you believe in unicorns. All of you, mashallah, are the same. You'll all end up in heaven. We don't believe in that concept. We don't believe in the idea that it doesn't matter what path of faith you have, as long as it's your path, who am I to judge? That religious pluralism we don't accept. We also don't accept Islamic pluralism as well. Meaning different versions of Islam, all are correct, all will go into heaven. We don't accept that at all. There are people, like I said, who stop at, at, at Imam Sajjad, those who stop at uh, Imam Sadiq, those who stop at Imam, Imam uh, uh, Qadim al-Islam, those who believe right now that Imam al has already come. Those are all different versions, a lighter version, a watered down version of the actual path itself, right? So let's not, let's not shy away from this very sensitive, even now there might be some of you who are very uncomfortable in my discussion. But if you look at some of the things that are coming about now, there is a concern. And parents are concerned as well inside their homes. That you know, my child now is questioning everything, Mulana. From the tasbih that we have, to the muhr that we have, to the qibla that we have, to everything. And while questioning is not a problem, but sometimes those youth don't give those questions its due respect. And they end up rejecting their aqidah and their ideology and accepting ones that don't make logical sense. Okay, We cannot accept dhulm when it happens. We have to sometimes have very delicate conversations historically. To talk about the fact that what happened in Saqifa was zulm on the, on the Islamic Ummah. It was a deviation from that deen e haq. That the Ghadir was the proper deen e haq and that path that followed the Holy Prophet. Like I talked about, فَتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبْكُمْ Allah. It, that can't be conditional. It can't be that. Look, and there were people, individuals, and you know this history better than I do. On the day of Ghadir that would come to the Prophet and say, come on, Holy Prophet, what is this? I was, ready for, I was ready to give my life for you in Badr and Ahad. I was there in Khandak and Khaybar, Fatih Mecca, Hudaybiya, everything. I was there beside you. But now you make Ali, your Damat, your son in law, the, the successor of this empire. I don't accept this. And we've seen the consequences of that afterwards. There were a handful of people left after Ghadir. After Saqifa, even more so, there were a handful of people. 
to the point where Imam Hassan was forced to do solah with someone like Muawiyah, to the point where Imam Hussein to wake up the nation had to get his head cut off. All to establish that this is the path. Do not deviate from the path. Time and time again, Imam Hussein said that what? People have left your path, Rasulullah. I'm now bringing them back onto the path. I'm showing them that dine haq path, that they've gone down the road. Even today, the image of Islam has nothing to do with dine haq. The image of Islam of black flags and Donald's what else has nothing to do with, the, with, with, with dine haq. Are they a majority? Yes, they're a majority. Absolutely. They're in, the, they're, they're in the millions, no doubt. But that doesn't equate the fact that they are on the right path. It's a privilege to my youth out there that you are right now being raised in a Shia household. And that privilege you will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. That your mother spent every waking minute from when you were an infant to remind you that you know there are 12 imams and there are 14 masumin and there are 72 shuhada. Time, there are songs now, lullabies that our mothers would sing to us that now I sing to my kids. Reminding them of, about the numbers, 1, 5, 12, 14, 17, all these things are a privilege. And that privilege was meant to give you so you can climb the ladder of spirituality, not destroy the base that your parents built for you. Okay? So we have to understand. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <clears throat> Again, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you very sensitive, very hassas discussions, I agree. But ones that I believe are very, very much needed. In this time of fasting and ibadat and worship, where we are the closest to Allah, and our hearts are the softest, and we are readily available to do as much worship as possible, in that act of worship, ask Allah for yaqeen and certainty in your ideology. Because right now, as I said, there is a play with our youth. There are billions of dollars being used to dismantle the Shia ideology. There are videos being posted on YouTube. There are groups, there are groups out there that their primary focus is to destroy any Shia speaker, any Shia youth. They challenge them to debates. And they know a couple of verses in good Arabic, good makharij. They sound like they know what they're talking about, right? Because they're Arabs. And our youth can't respond with one hadith or one verse. And they're videotaping it, it's, it's, it's going viral. And in the process, the Shia ideology is taking a hit one by one by one. Let's start off with our home base. Let's just start, we'll start off with our hearts inside the month of Ramadan. Let's understand the privilege of faith that you've been given, all of you. That we've all been given. And that deen e haq is always one. It's not adiyan e haq, it's deen e haq. One deen, and that deen is the path of the Ahlul Bayt. We ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> to accept our qaleel ibadat, inshaAllah. We ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's uh, so much fitna and so much fasad and corruption all over the world. We ask you, Allah, to strengthen the iman of our youth and our elders, inshallah. We ask you, Allah, in this month of Allah, to forgive our sins and accept our tawbah, inshallah. We ask you, Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's so much bloodshed, so much tyranny and injustice all over the world that we ask you, Allah, to weaken the hands of the enemies of Islam, to strengthen the mustaz afin all over the world. And finally, Allah, we ask you, because it's qabil and worthy of Imam Zaman al-Zuhur, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.